People are coming in. Hey, Emilio. Welcome, sir. Oh, look at that. We even we even started a second early. Oh, my goodness. We're on time. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Hi, Frank. I can't see anybody's faces yet, but... Uh... Lame. Turn on your videos. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah marzena i don't know if i'm saying your name right i apologize and others who are are here or are joining welcome welcome to rei secrets special live training and story session on the purchase and sale agreement uh we're we're very happy to have you all here and uh for those who are tuning in on the live stream uh i hope you enjoy this um, if whether you're a real estate investor or not, I think uh, this is going to be very interesting to listen in on and learn some of what Keith has been through uh, as you know, someone who's been running a real estate investing business uh, himself for a number of years. When did you start again, Keith? 2016, a little over eight years ago. Yeah, so um, not that long. And yet in eight years, it is amazing what you can... Uh, <laughs> have done to yeah. you Both good um, and bad. as a real estate investor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I, I don't know if you guys read the emails I was sending out, but um, one of the things that Keith explained to me is that uh, real estate investing is a litigation heavy uh, industry. There, there is frequent contact from lawyers Yep. Uh, or by your own lawyer in some cases. Um, so this is apparently just normal in the industry. Uh, but I, maybe it depends on on you and how good you are at negotiating. Dude, but some man. people may feel like they don't want to sell you their house anymore after they get a better offer. A couple of years <laughs> ago, I was at a mastermind. There's probably 120 people in the room. And uh, the presenter said, if you have ever been sued, please raise your hand. And out of 120 people, there was probably eight of us that raised our hands. And he goes, Rick, go ahead. High to the sky. You know, it, it, it's something to be proud of. You're going to get it. It's going to happen. If it hasn't happened yet, it's going to. He's like, now look at these people. You could just tell by the way they walk. They've just got a little bit, a little bit more oomph in their step. You know, and I've always that remembered swagger. it. It's like it's almost a rite <laughs> of passage in real estate. I'm not. It's horrible getting sued. It's such an energy drain. I don't enjoy it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it certainly is going. How to about happen. you guys? Anyone here? You can you can raise your hand, or you can just uh, let us know. Have Have any of you experienced um, a lawsuit or had to sue anyone specifically uh, in real estate? In real estate. Not not outside of that, but as a real estate investor, have you had to deal with that yet? Anybody? You can put it in the chat if you want. Frank, how about you? Thanks for turning your video on, brother. <laughs> You're muted too, by the way. Have I, you? I think uh, I saw you not your yet, thank God. Not yet. Yeah. Cool. How about you? Hey, Delano. It's hard to see you. Looks like it's nighttime there. Have you dealt with a lawsuit before, sir? No. Oh, well, that's good to hear. Yeah. Well, I'm not in real estate, and I have. <laughs> I was running a business for uh, about 10 years in, in here in Japan, where I am. And yeah, I mean, it's interesting. People will sue for the stupid stuff. getting offended yeah. <laughs> if you offend them. So um, it, it's unfortunate, but you need to have, uh, for that reason, things to protect you in your business, right? And the purchase and sale agreement is one of those uh, things that should both protect you um, from lawsuits as well as protect your assets and your ability to make profit either through assigning contracts or uh, acquiring properties. So Keith is going to tell us all about that. He sent me. Over an hour's worth of audio messages <laughs> last night telling me all about how awesome his contract is because I asked him to. And I was like, wow, that's great. Please share these stories um, because they help you guys understand uh, what can happen 
uh, to you as a real estate investor and how your purchase and sale agreement is going to help uh, cover your assets. <laughs> okay, good. I'm going to throw it over to Keith here uh, and enjoy, guys. I need to um, I need to get really clear on what you do want me to say and what you don't want me to say or show. Okay. You're not allowed to show the actual contract. Okay, Sorry, I can everyone. just maybe talk about. And the, the here's the reason: I don't want someone going through the video and pausing it and trying to like copy it and then messing it up and then blaming us because <laughs> they're whatever. You know, it's just it. It's just silly. Um, if you want it and the training around it, you know, we do sell this, and I'll give a link. Uh, to that, there's a course. It's got documents. It's got training. All that stuff. Yeah, right. <laughs> George. <laughs> right, George. Exactly. Oh, I love it. I, love I knew it. you All would, right. George. That's why so, we love you. <clears throat> I'll kind of just start this off, I guess, with um, sort of the same, the same way that I started my voice memos to you. How many voice memos did I end up sending? It was um, twelve. There were, I counted. Really? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. 13 voice memos. Woo! Well, you got to start off with what What did you begin with? Yeah. All so right. What was your, 20, your first contract and, and how did that happen? And that guy who mentored you, the $1 man, tell him $1 about the $1 man. man. 2016 is when I got started in real estate. Um, I had this this older gentleman, he's probably in his early 70s. He'd been in real estate for a little over 40 years, I think 40 or 45 years. He owned a lot of doors in Northern Virginia, um, Maryland, Delaware. And um, I met him at a ARIA event, Real Estate Investing Association event. And uh, he really liked me. He said, hey, I want you to come, come not work for me, but you know, work with me. Um, and I'll pay you if, if you do well. And uh, so one of the things that he gave me was his purchase and sales agreement. He says, hey, I'm going to teach you how to, how to negotiate. And uh, when you get a property that you feel like is good, then you're going to you're gonna pay for the deal. So he gave me this one-page contract. It's a one-page purchase and sales agreement. It was absolutely the simplest thing you've ever seen in your whole entire life. It looked like it was written um, you know, with fifth or sixth grade reading level. It was all in layman's term. There was no legal ease. There was nothing. And it was in large font. Pretty sure it was in like size 14 font. Um, absolutely terrible looking back. But, you know, he did teach me. He said, Keith, I'm known as the $1 man. Whenever I go to a RIA event, um, people like recognize my face and they don't remember my name. They remember me as the $1 man because every single property that I've ever bought, I only put up $1 for earnest money. And I go, wow, that's really, really neat. And, and the reason for that is because in the state of, Virginia case law had stated that for due consideration to be valid, money needed to exchange hands and the amount of money needed to be four quarters. And so he would literally, he had a, a big old roll of quarters in his car. He would literally take in four quarters, every single house that he went and slap it on the table. This is my due consideration. This is my $1 EMD. And so actually ever since then, quite literally, since the, my very first uh, appointment with a seller, every house that I've ever bought to this day, I said, I want to be the $1 man too. And I have bought every house with $1 EMD. Um, I got started off with that purchase and sales agreement, kind of apprenticing under this gentleman. But the contract that we were using did not hold up. And uh, at the time I was stationed in Washington, DC, I was active duty in the Marine Corps and I moved from there to Kanehoe Bay, Hawaii. And uh, so I was no longer being, you know, kind of under this guy's wing. I got myself a better contract. It was a three page contract, size 12 font. It's pretty good, all right? It was, it was really, really solid, um, but it didn't allow me to do certain things. It also like a sign or Novate, um, and it, it also didn't protect me against certain things like a seller not cooperating and giving us access to a house for us to do our, our inspection or like a home inspection or, or uh, having the utilities on or things like this. It also didn't have any form of extensions. So now we have what's called a unilateral right to extend, which basically means I don't need to get permission to extend the close of escrow. 
Um, I just tell them, hey, I'm exercising my unilateral right to extend. It's 30 business days, which is approximately like 42 calendar days or something like that. Um, and, and there was no extensions. Now we have an automatic extension built into our purchase and sales agreement. If a seller is um, not cooperating or they're just dragging their feet, not getting us photos, not getting the utilities turned on, not allowing us to inspect the home, so on and so forth. Or if there's title issues, if they have personal logistics, there's a family emergency, whatever. Those are all actually explicitly stated in the purchase and sales agreement. And it says, if any of these happen due to the seller, so if it's my fault, we can't extend. That's on me. But if it's on the seller, we're going to extend the close of escrow in seven day increments indefinitely until the seller performs the closing. And I have had so many freaking attorneys call me up and say, you have clouded the title. One of the things that I do, another one of the things that our purchase and sales agreement does is it allows us to file a memorandum of contract or an affidavit of purchase and sales agreement, depending on the state that you're in. And what that does is it effectively clouds title and disallows that seller from going behind my back and selling it to another investor for slightly more because it's going to pop a cloud's title. It pops up in a title report and they have to, it acts as like a lien. They have to then pay me off. Um, but really I want to close on the house. I want to do the deal. I don't do this to freaking have memos pop and make a couple thousand dollars. I want to do a deal. And um, so I, I'll have a, this just happened mm, three weeks ago, four, uh, four weeks ago. I had a, an attorney call me from Pennsylvania. He said, Keith, if I understand you correctly, he gave me the address. He said, if I understand you correctly, uh, you put this property under contract in October of last year. And I said, yes, sir, that's correct. He said, well, your closing date um, has, has passed. And I said, that's correct. He said, well, your contract is not valid. And I said, that's not correct. Do you have the contract in front of you? No, I don't have the contract in front of me. Okay, well, why do you think that my contract isn't valid? And he said, well, because the seller um, texted me a little screenshot with his finger showing close of escrow as the state. I said, yeah, what that, what that seller failed to tell you is that uh, he ghosted me. He wouldn't reply to my text messages, my phone calls, my emails. He wouldn't let us get a home inspection. He wouldn't cooperate giving us access to the house. So I could close on the house. I'm not gonna close on a house sight unseen. That would be ridiculous. And, um, and, and he, wasn't, he wasn't responsive. And so I filed this memorandum because I felt like he was gonna ghost me. He was gonna go behind my back and he was gonna try to sell it to somebody else. And uh, so may I ask, um, has he entered into an agreement with another buyer? He says, yes, he has. <laughs> okay. Uh, he said, well, are you going to close on the house? And I said, I sure can. And he said, but you can't without doing another purchase and sales agreement. I said, no, this is false. We have an automatic extension in seven day increments indefinitely until the seller performs the closing. So my close of escrow, as far as I see it, is this upcoming Friday. I'm ready to rock and roll. Your seller just needs to give me access to the house. I still have got the money. I'm still the good, good to purchase it at the price and, and at, the, at the terms and everything that's outlined in the purchase and sales. And he said, let me, let me, get, back to, uh, let me get back to you. I'm going to talk to the seller. So anyway, we ended up settling for um, $12,000. They paid me $12,000 to release uh, my memo. And the reason why they were okay with doing that is because um, we negotiate pretty hard and somebody else had come in like $25,000 higher than where I was. And so he's, he's happy because he's walking away with $12,000 more. I'm walking or $13,000 more. I'm walking away with $12,000 in my pocket. I don't have to deal with title, raising money, flipping a house, deal, you know, waiting for my money or anything like that. Um, Hey Keith, we're getting a, um, questions from Pat in oh, the uh, chat. Do you want to answer them now or save them for the end? How do you want to do that? Um, yeah, Thanks for asking, Pat. I already forgot Appreciate where I was questions. going, so I may as well. Uh, <laughs> where <laughs> are you going? going? Unilateral extension is only some extensions is holding us up. No, heck no. Unilateral extension is is really for us. So there's two extensions that we have. One extension is a contingency for us. One extension is a contingency for the seller. And so what, I, what do I mean? Um, if the seller is being a bottleneck, a cog in the wheel, they're not cooperating, they're hindering us, hindering. they're dragging their feet, they're not giving us access, they're not cooperating, they're not corresponding, whatever, 
then that's the extension where we extend in, in seven day increments indefinitely until the seller performs the closing. Whereas the unilateral right to extend, this is if I am encountering troubles, either I haven't raised the money, I haven't found my buyer, that sort of thing. This buys me enough time to go ahead and get the money or get the buyer to do the deal. Does that fully answer the question before I go to the next one? Cool. I take it you need a memo filed to use this unilateral extension. No, you do not need a memo to file or to use your unilateral extension. All you need is an email. Um, it, it has to be expressly written. Uh, so via snail mail or via email, anything we, we have it written in our purchase and sales agreement, that email is to be construed as written. Um, and so you don't need to have a memo filed in order to use the unilateral extension. However, you don't have recourse if you don't have a memo. You don't have recourse if you don't have a memo. So unilateral is made up by you guys or a new law that went into effect. Um, I don't quite understand. It's something that a lawyer and Keith worked on and put in our contract there's no law but of course if it's in the contract then it is effectively legally binding when someone signs it so uh it's not like you need a new law to make no, this no, work there's no okay it just says it there in the contract and the person signs and they're like hey yeah We're... that's right not everyone would know about this and there's i'm sure lots of contracts that don't have it so it is uh it is a unique feature <laughs> we um uh, yeah, honestly we didn't his contract we didn't have it until this this year i think the unilateral is one of the more right recent I think so it's, it's interesting like how many it. how many iterations do you think that your your psa has gone through 50 60 yeah well <laughs> so over the course and... of over the course of eight years so i, I started this uh, with this contract in late probably probably July or August of 2016. And since then I've had my own six or seven attorneys look over it uh, throughout that time, just different geographical spots. Um, you know, we had our attorney in Texas look over it at first and then in Virginia, then I moved to Hawaii. Then I have a friend in Tennessee who looked over it and I was going through a lawsuit last year in Illinois um and then my current one in florida that's six or is that seven? One, two, three, four, five, six. it doesn't matter um i wasn't I've, counting we've, we've had them we've had them look <laughs> at it multiple times actually anytime something comes up yeah that pisses me off enough that it's like this is never going to happen again i'll go to an attorney and i'll say i'll pay you a thousand dollars make sure that this never happens write it into my purchase and sales agreement make it freaking airtight make sure that it doesn't collude is collude the right word like it conflicts with something else that's written in the purchase and sales agreement it doesn't conflict. right it's gonna conflict yeah okay very interesting so well let's please share there? some interesting stories now keith i want to we yeah. want to all hear about uh about that family feud oh yeah yeah oh dude i'm still in the middle of this i actually got oh, great oh, news i got great news on that oh great really, then yes. you can share it with everyone yeah. that's gonna be really funny all right we'll, we'll share a win get your Pat, popcorn people to your um to your last <laughs> message you said okay so this isn't known by everybody wondering why i haven't heard of it i i don't know why you haven't heard of it either um unilateral right to extend is is super old like it's not just real estate Con it's in contract law that basically just says like hey i have a a one-time exclusive right. I don't need your permission. I don't have to ask. I just tell you that I'm going to extend for this many days. That's what unilateral means. And you you can only do it once. So you can't unilateral extend it by 30 days. And then like you still freaking biffed it and you, you don't have your buyer, you don't have your money and say, oh, I'm going to extend it again. No, you can't do that. That's, that's not right. Um, I was trying to just mentally go through the paragraphs, I think I was going to go into like due diligence was next. Um, I've had yeah, a lot of, I mean, that's, I had a, a lot of, uh, a lot of attorneys look at it besides mine, uh, because they're coming at me. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we, we've had our, our six or seven look at it, but then I've had tons. I get an attorney, one attorney, at least one attorney 
per month, every month, calling me saying, Hey, you know, this, this memo popped, you had this property under contract. And I go, I document everything. All right. Team documents, everything. So we have emails, we have call recordings, and it always comes down to the seller is being disingenuous. You cannot sell me your house. And then one week later, sell the same house to somebody else. You cannot enter into a purchase and sales agreement twice. And that's been a, a reoccurring theme, unfortunately. And so I'll have an attorney. Um, this probably goes back to February of this year. I had an attorney call me up. Uh, <laughs> I posted it on my Facebook. So it's somewhere in February, maybe in March. It was in Illinois. I had to reach out to a friend because <clears throat> I didn't really know what to do. I'd never had this happen. The seller, Ryan, do you remember where they filed the complaint? It was with the attorney general, right? It was like Illinois attorney general or, or, district yeah, attorney. or a district attorney in Illinois. I don't know if it's attorney general or district attorney. I'm pretty I think sure it's, it's a DA. I think it's AG, but it doesn't oh, really, really? AG. It's somebody, okay. It's somebody who has okay. uh, some power in <laughs> in Illinois that people go and complain to whenever they can't afford to have a lawyer. And they said, this person put me under contract and, and they never, um, they never did good on their word. They didn't close on my house. They filed this memo, this memorandum, and um, I need them to, to release it. Yeah. It's a, it's AG. You're right. AG, Attorney general, okay. uh, Illinois. Yeah. So <laughs> I get this and I'm like, I'm, I've never gotten in trouble with the attorney general for any state that we we invest in. And so I was like, snap, like, I don't know how big of a deal this is. Like, should I go get legal representation right now before I even respond? Reached out to a good friend of mine. He's like, dude, do not worry about this. Send an email and this is what it says. And he literally helped me draft the email. I included my purchase and sales agreement. I included my memorandum. And he said, all you have to do is point out these two things. He said, do you have a due diligence period. Some people call it an inspection period. And I said, yeah. And he said, okay. And did you, did you use it up? And I said, I can't. <laughs> he goes, I've never heard that before. And the reason why he said that is because typical due diligence periods are seven days, 10 days, 14 days, or 15 days. So maybe you'll get a 30 day due diligence period or an inspection period, whatever. And this gives you authority to go and inspect the house and then pull out of the deal if if it's going to be too costly. And our due diligence period using our purchase and sales agreement actually goes up until the hour of closing. I can back out of the contract for any reason up until the hour of closing wow. without any negative repercussion. Like I don't even lose my $1 EMD. And so he's like, dude, you have nothing to worry about. You don't even need to point out the second thing, which the second thing was close of escrow, do you have an extension for it? And then he wanted to make sure that I had my memo file. Of course I had my memo file. And so we drafted up the, the email, sent it over to the attorney general that basically said, on this day, I, the lead came in, the seller, seller contacted me. On this day, we went under contract. On this day, scheduled the home inspection. Uh, on this day, the seller failed to open the door for the home inspection. We rescheduled. They failed again. They went dark on this. We attempted, 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 attempted to contact them via email, text, and phone call. They didn't do it. Here's the day that we filed the memorandum. Here's the stamp because it's filed in public record. Um, and, and here we are. I did nothing wrong, certainly nothing illegal. And so she's saying in the, in the attorney general report that I was a fraudulent company. And so I was, I was tempted to just download every HUD from every house that we've bought this year and be like, yeah, okay. Fraudulent company, huh? Fra fraudulent. I just buys houses fraudulently. No, you can't, you don't buy houses fraudulently. Um, so I was tempted to do that. I ended up not doing it. Just sent the purchase and sales agreement, circling the two areas that I needed to and the memorandum stating, Hey, if they want to pursue this, I'll sue them. I have a specific performance clause. That's another thing that we should talk about. Specific performance basically says, if you back out of this, if you try to not sell me the house, you try to sell it to somebody else, you try to keep the house, whatever, that you can actually take them to court and you will win. Through specific performance, you will force the sale of the home. I don't like this. I don't do this. I've never done this. I don't plan on doing it, by the way. Um, but it is there as an option. It's a nuclear or, option. Yeah. 
not only will yeah. I force the sale, we have deterrent. A, we have a very beefed up default clause. It's a seller and buyer yeah. default clause, meaning we're both protected. So if I default, they keep my EMD, they can take me to court. I have to pay reasonable court costs, blah, blah, blah. But also the back half is the seller default clause. If the seller backs out, I can sue them. I'm going to get the house. We'll force the sale of the house. And I'm going to be awarded a judgment predetermined and pre mutually agreed upon by all parties in the amount of $25,000. So not only am I going to get the house, I'm going to get awarded a judgment of $25,000 and you have to pay my attorney fees. Are we sure we want to play this game? We have three options moving forward. So when people back out, at this point, I just have a script. When people want to back out of a contract, I have three different things that I take them through. Here are your three options. Which option do you want? And I'm not going to, listen, just because it's written in, in writing doesn't mean that I'm going to do it. Or, and it doesn't mean that you should do it. I think that you're a bad person if you kick somebody to the street. I also feel like there's sometimes um, you can see by my wall decor behind me, um, I'm a gun-loving American. I'd rather have a gun and not have to use it than, than not have a gun, you know? So I'd rather I have, right. I'd rather have the, the power to do something um, and, and never, never go through with it. Okay. Um, we've talked about the default. We talked about two ways to extend. The due diligence period goes up until the hour of closing. At any point in time, if I find something that's wrong with a deal, I can pull out of the deal. No, neg no negative repercussions. Ryan, was there any other things that you felt were? Well, I think, um, oh, you know, I mean, that family feud one was interesting because it's such a complex yes, situation yes, yes. when there's like multiple people who have claim to the title. They're all on it. That's really yeah. interesting. So, so that's a really interesting story. This is a house that I have in, in, I don't know the city. It's somewhere in Louisiana. And um, this lady contacted us. She said she wanted to sell her house. And um, we negotiated, it's a killer deal. We negotiated, I think, a $24,000 purchase price for a 1,100 square foot, three bed, two bath. As a condition, I think it's worth about 100,000. So I was really happy with the $24,000 purchase price. But in addition to a great price, we also got great terms. And so we split that, that $24,000 into some now, some later. We were going to give her, we gave her $12,000 now and $12,000 later once the house was cleaned and vacated. And so, <laughs> it was such a blessing because what I didn't know until after close was that her late husband had six children when he passed she uh she signs it's called an affidavit of airship airship so she swears under oath this man was my husband he passed here's my marriage certificate here's his death certificate i was married to him he's dead and he has no living heirs she committed a felony she lied under oath because that man had six kids that I unintentionally screwed out of their inheritance. And so two days after we close on the sale of this property, I had given her the $12,000, some now. The some later money, the $12,000 was still in the escrow account of our closing attorney. Two days after we close. I think I gave her like five days to move out or a week or something to move out. She's basically already moved out, just had some stuff that she needed to pack up. And um, two days afterwards, an unknown man who refused to give up his ID waltzes into my, the closing attorney's office and slaps my attorney with a lawsuit and says, you're screwing me and my five siblings out of our rightful inheritance when you bought the house or when you authorized the purchase of the house by this company for this address. And the man says, I don't know what you're talking about. We just closed on this two days ago and I have a signed affidavit by this woman stating that there are no heirs. And he said, well, she lied. Um, I'm her son or stepson. I think it's 
steps are. And um, so there's there's these children. It's a family feud. It's like, it's a horrible family feud. People have gotten in fist fights. One person has gone to jail uh, because there's three kids on this side and there's three kids on this side. And ironically, the parents flipped like the mom and dad uh, like the other person's children more and they hate their own kids and have disowned their kids. It's crazy to me. So I get slapped with this lawsuit and I, I'm, I don't know what to do. And so I went to my mentor and he said, well, countersue them and bury them in discovery, force the sale of the house, get the kids what they want, then they're never going to go through with a lawsuit because it's going to cost them more. The discovery that I put them in, like literally it will take them five years of paperwork and just nonsense to get out. It will, it will cost them $50,000 to get through discovery with an attorney before we can actually even go to court. And so that's what I did. We buried them in discovery and I'm forcing the sale of the home. It's going through um, sheriff sale. It's going to go to auction probably in about a month. And the reason why I have to do, it's so weird to do the right thing. I have to counter sue somebody. It, it's very odd. Our, our legal uh, system is, is crazy to me. And Louisiana has very weird, it's called Napoleonic law. I'm not sure if anybody is from Louisiana, but it's odd. It's very, very, very odd. It's called Napoleonic law. So I have to counter sue to do the right thing because I don't want to screw these kids out of their inheritance. And uh, I own 50% of the home because she sold her 50% to me. So le like rightfully, I own 50%. Legally, sworn affidavit. <laughs> I own 100% of the house. But uh, if those kids ever were to win the lawsuit, which they absolutely would, because all they have to do is show their birth certificate. It's going to overturn her. She's going to go to jail and I'm going to either title insurance is going to pop uh, because there's going to be a claim on title insurance, or we're going to have to sell the house and, and get the kids the money. So rather than go through all of that mess, I just said, I'm going to force the sale. Well, one of the kids do doesn't want to leave. He's living in the house right now today. He called me over the weekend. No, he called me on Monday. Anyway, uh, he's moving. He has been sitting in the house. I couldn't evict him this whole time because he has, could I evict him? Yes, legally I could because I own 100% of the house. Is that the right thing to do? No, technically he owns one twelfth of the house. It's as much his house as it is all of his other siblings. So I chose, I have chosen to not evict him and he's moving, which may mean that I don't have to force the auction and I could just sell it with a realtor for full market value and not rush the sale and make a heck of a lot more money doing it that way. So anyway, this is totally crazy. A little bit to do with the purchase and sales agreement because I was able to fall back on all of my, all of my rights. Um, and this guy was like, again, it always comes back to how does it look in court? At this point, I've been to court three separate occasions and Unfortunately, all of us here, if you ever get the pleasure to go, go to court, you're the big, rich, nasty, greedy, out of town investor with all the money that doesn't give a crap about the house, the person or the community. You're just there to make a quick buck and run. That's how it's perceived. Just like just letting you know. And so having all the documentation so that you can show, nope, this is what we agreed to. That's not what we agreed to, really, because I have a call recording where I walked you through paragraph by paragraph explaining everything in layman's terms. Then I answered all of your questions. Then I handled your object objections, changed the purchase and sales agreement to what we agreed to, and then made sure that you didn't want to have legal counsel. I'll provide it for you before you sign. Go ahead. Call me the big bad wolf. But when I show that in front of the judge, you're screwed. We've never got there. Why? Because I have all the documentation to back me up. The purchase yeah. and sales agreement, the call recordings, the emails, the memorandum, the whole process. So that's a good point to make sure you've documented the, the acquisition process from beginning to end. Yeah. Um, however, you do talk to your seller leads. If you don't have some kind of system that records the calls, then that's definitely something that you should get. Um, I think we use smartphone, mm -hmm. 
is one of them, but there's All rails a bunch. Ones. Yeah, a bunch that do that. So you, you don't want to just be doing this on your cell phone and <laughs> not having the the recordings uh, backed up and, um, you know, organized so that you can reference them when you need to. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Well, a common one probably is where you get under contract with someone and because you're so darn good at negotiating, you get a great deal on, on the, on the contract, on the sale. And then they, they decide that, uh, they can get a little bit more. Yep. And they and they uh, so they start shopping the deal around after they're under contract, which is neither right legally or morally. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this has come. Has anyone had this happen where uh, someone's tried to um, back out of the deal or um, tried to find a different buyer after after they've been under contract? Anybody dealt with that before? There, that's there's definitely some hands that need I to I care. yeah I mean I Certainly. if you don't I would be shocked Anybody's or or you guys they, haven't haven't our, done um, this long enough <laughs> our contract which is fine our last paragraph is really good when we so like I said I we literally on every single property that we ever put under contract we walk them through we have a little cheat sheet we walk them through our purchase and sales agreement and the last paragraph says the seller is of lawful age of sound mind and is able to make rational decisions seller is not now under the undue influence of alcohol drugs or any other mind altering substance nor is seller taking medication that would cloud the seller's judgment or make the seller unable to think clearly the seller is who they say they are is the owner of the property and is able to contract for its sale without any joinder by others the seller is not under duress and has agreed to sell the property to buyer freely and willingly Seller has agreed to sell the pro property to buyer only because it is in the seller's best interest after considering all of the factors. Seller understands what it is signing and has all of its questions answered. Seller is therefore not confused about any of the provisions of this agreement. Seller understands that by signing this agreement, the seller has agreed to sell the property to the buyer and is now bound by the terms and conditions described in this agreement. Seller further understands that the seller cannot change their mind or cancel the contract at some later date without being in default of this agreement, nor can the seller continue to market the property to any other buyer or tenant. And I read that to them every time. And I ask, do you understand? And do you agree? Yes, Keith, I agree. Let's just get the deal done. That, my friends, is your get out of jail free card. <laughs> We can yeah, so you were every... telling me about an interesting, yeah, right? So you were telling me about an interesting one where I think someone, you had them under contract, you had negotiated it effectively, uh, and they tried to sell it, uh, the house, to someone else. And then maybe it was something, was it your memorandum or something? I don't know. I don't remember exactly. It, something came up. and the wholesale. The one your that wholesale, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then you you ended up wholesaling it to their buyer. You got this, uh, this happened <laughs> last year. A good deal, and they yeah. got the buyer. Was, <laughs> was so funny. All um, yeah. all parties. Do you remember the numbers? I remember there's a sixty thousand dollars spread, and I know that I made twenty five grand. Right. Um, that was okay. that's all I remember too. Let's just, that's the intent. So I'm going to make up the numbers. The intent of the story is that there's a sixty thousand dollars spread, and I made twenty five k. Who cares about about the other numbers. This is a fictitious story, but with a real representation. So let's say that I had the property under contract for 125,000, let's make easy numbers, $140,000. I have a property under contract for $140,000. And the buyer, the new buyer, I'm buyer number one, because people like to lie. I'm buyer number one. Seller sells the house to me for $140,000. Ghosts me, doesn't talk to me for two, three months. And uh, title pops. An attorney calls me. Hey, Keith, you have this property under contract? Yes, I do. Great. Um, I'm representing whatever company. They say that they have a purchase and sales agreement with the seller. Okay, what's the date of ratification on theirs? It's this date. Okay, my date of ratification is this date. Therefore, I win. <laughs> 
Um, and he goes, okay, um, is it okay if I just put you directly in contact with the buyer? Hell yeah, that cost me a lot less money, please. <laughs> I'd love to talk directly with the buyer. And um, so I call this guy up and uh, it, super great guy, loved this guy. And uh, we, we, we're talking shop or anything. He's like, hey, I know that I, I really don't have any leg to stand on, but if you don't mind me asking, what do you have this property locked up for? And I say $140,000. He goes, oh my God, are you serious? $140,000 is incredible. That's like 50 cents on the dollar. Less than, it was, it was less than 50 cents on the dollar. And I said, yeah, man, that's, that's why I don't want to sell it to you. <laughs> I'm going to make like $80,000 on this house. And uh, he goes, well, Keith, what, what if I were to pay you just the sweetest assignment fee? And, you know, you, you kind of have to play hardball. I said, no, I, I still don't want it. I want to, I want to buy this house. This is a great house. And uh, it's in North Carolina. I feel like I remember it's like off of South Ridge Hill or something like that. I could look it up in a little bit. Um, so I said, I, I don't want to, I don't want to sell it. I don't want to assign it. I want to buy it. And he said, Keith, what, what will it take? Thanks, sweetie. What will it take for you to sell me this house? I want to put my mom in it. And I live literally three minutes away. Of course, you got to go freaking say this. I, he's probably flat out lying, by the way. I don't care. He pulled the mom card on me. And I said, um, you know, I have in my contract a $25,000 default clause. So if you'll just cover that for the seller, I would go away. And he said, so, so you make a $25,000 assignment fee. And I said, yeah, technically it'd be a, a $25,000 assignment fee, but, but you're covering the default clause for the seller. And he said, okay, that, that makes sense. This way he couldn't freaking complain about the price, right? He's hooking the seller up, which he really liked. So now I'm playing my moral authority card. You want to, you want to hook up the seller. I'm going to hook up your mom. You want to hook up your mom. Don't complain about the price. We both know this is a smoking deal. I said, how much do you have the property under contract for? He says, I have it under contract for $200,000. I go, you suck at negotiating, bro. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I do. I'm just going to hold on to and buy it as a rental. So I wasn't worried about getting it at the steepest discount. And I said, well, if you pay me um, $25,000, we're going from 140 to 165. What's to stop the seller from just going to me? Because the seller nets the same, right? If he buys it for 165 and he and I get this 25 gap, then the seller still is only walking away with $140,000. So I suggested to him, I said, in order to help the seller, like to sell this to the seller, give the seller an extra $10,000. So now he's buying it for 175. Does everybody understand this breakdown? So now it's $150,000 going to the seller and $25,000 going to me. And he still got a deeper discount than what he had originally thought he was going to purchase the house for because he bought it for 175. So he made $25,000 more than what he expected to. I made $25,000 on my assignment fee. And the seller made $10,000 more than we originally agreed on. It was a triple win. And maybe even mom got to live in the house. Who knows? Uh, but that's yeah, a triple win. Happening. Exactly. Yeah, because it's, it's the, really uh, funny. Because of the. So if you yeah. want to learn how to negotiate, we've got some scripts and <laughs> training yeah. on that as well. Um, so that you can get, <laughs> you know, contracts at uh, much less than other people uh, in, in some cases. Not always, but hey. Um, yeah, interesting. I think that's a great one. And probably, you know, you're going to deal with that a lot. So you need to be yeah. able to have something to fall back on in your contract that says, oh, no, 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 you, you are not allowed to, you know, shop, shop around after it's under contract. Here's where it says I explain it to you. Here's the call recording, all that stuff. Um, there was another thing you were telling me about, about, uh, the contract says that it can be assigned, yeah. but then there was like a, a case where a judge in a court case where they like dismissed it. Cause it just said, said yes. it in one line. It was like cryptic, you know, and that yeah. that wasn't going to hold up. This was and in... then, so now you added like something. 
Yeah, this was in Hawaii. When I moved to Hawaii in 2017, I started wholesaling. I was exclusively wholesaling, actually. And um, and it, I wasn't able to, I got in trouble, basically, by an attorney in Hawaii because somebody had complained saying, hey, this guy isn't closing on my house. He's just like pawning it off onto somebody else. This is by freaking definition. It's wholesaling, right? Like, <laughs> um. For some reason, people have the, the price still stays the same. The closing date still stays the same. It's just no longer Crown Properties is going to be on the title when they buy it. It's now somebody else's freaking company. Whatever. So, um, yes, I, I go to my attorney and he said, yeah, there's there was this case that happened uh, when it and it wasn't even real estate, by the way. It was something else. It was I don't remember what it was like a power washing company's agreement or something like this. When he sold his company, he's going to assign his Rolodex. So when you sell the company, all of your clientele, maybe it was like lawn service or something like that. I just remember it was like a service-based business, power washing, lawn service, mobile detailing, something like that. He was going to assign all of his clientele to the new, new business owner, right? That, that way he's not just buying the material, but he's buying the asset, which is the clientele. And um, in, in a court case, it said, oh, no, 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 no. You can't do that to your clients. Like you've been with your clients for some of them, eight, nine, 10 years. And they're not expecting the level of, of service to change. And he said, but it was in my contract. So they went back under contract law. He's correct. It said his company's name, we're entering into this agreement with his company's name, comma, and or assigns. And he lost, even though it said it right there, my company name and or assigned. So for example, I know I'm not supposed to like show too much. I won't show anything that's huge here. Keith, <laughs> make it. What are you showing them? <laughs> Just in the very, in the very beginning, how do I make this stupid thing bigger? Here we go. <clears throat> Zoom. Where, where it says the buyer and his slash her slash their or their entities, heirs, successors, personal representatives, and or assigns. So this used to just say and or assigns. Then I got in trouble some other way and we added all of this stuff in. I didn't get in trouble. We were doing estate planning, me and my wife. <clears throat> and we wanted to make it so that anything that was like currently under contract, because at any given time we have, I would say six to 20 properties under contract. If God forbid I were to pass away, um, then uh, we would need other people in the business to, to take care of them. Um, but it, it used to just say and or assigns. And uh, he said, yep, you can't do that. You need to have a whole paragraph explaining what does it mean to assign and make sure that they are approving it. And so now it says, the seller hereby grants the buyer the irrevocable right to partner with other investors and or to assign this agreement to a third party purchaser of the buyer's choosing or to novate this agreement with a replacement agreement with third blah, 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 blah. And then it, it goes into, it's a pretty big paragraph. It says that the new person is going to be responsible for the transfer tax and everything like this. And if it's assigned, it's going to be binding and ensured to the benefit of the party's respective successors and their assigns, blah, 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 blah. So... <laughs> We're in all 50 states at this point. You all probably know that wholesaling is going away. I think there are 17 states that have put in some, some laws. <clears throat> um, but in, in the other states, you can still wholesale houses. And in all 50 states, you can novate houses. And if your purchase and sales agreement doesn't say that you can, then this is foolish. Because if it doesn't say that you can assign, then you can't assign by default. If it doesn't say that you can novate, then you can't novate by default. It must expressly, in writing, it must expressly say, I am authorizing you to assign this agreement. I am authorizing you to novate this agreement. Yeah. So, I mean, essentially, the contract that you have allows you to do really any kind of exit that you would want. Is that, yeah. That's pretty important because, like, you know, if you guys are um, you're working a contract, you you might not necessarily want to wholesale it. 
but you're not, you know, you haven't decided yet what your exit strategy is going to be, but you're getting them under contract. You don't want to have to be like, well, I'm just exactly going to have right. to use my wholesaling contract because <laughs> I'm not sure, but I, I, I probably want to wholesale this. And then later you're like, crap, I could have made 120,000 on this if I had owner financed it or whatever, you know, it's like, that would be a, a critical error. Yeah. So having a, a, very flexible contract that allows you to exit However in you uh, in whatever way that you want um, is definitely helpful. Yeah. Cool. Any questions? I think we're we're you know it's it's seven. Uh, drop one in the chat here. Oh, you, you thank you, Pat. Just Here's four questions. A... You're the George. You're the George Lynch of today's live. <laughs> is George still here? Oh dang, he's not here anymore. Oh, he I is. Think, I oh no, him. he is. Sure, um, brother. <laughs> Pat, to answer your question here, um, I don't freaking know, nor do I care because number one, I'm not a realtor and number two, I'm never going to be a realtor. So this is totally not applicable to me. I know as much about yeah. that as I do the, um, the molecular, uh, compound of Mars. <laughs> okay. Interesting question though, Pat. And, um, yeah, we, yeah, it's hard to know. That's that's a that's one where you need a crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right. glad you didn't take offense and didn't sue me for it. Cool. Yeah. Hey, uh, any uh any questions you guys have you want to ask Keith about um or if you are interested you know I we do have this we've got a like a course that includes um, a bunch of documents. Uh, Keith, I'm gonna share this in the chat. So if you guys are interested in this, you can check it out. I'm not saying you need to uh, buy anything, of course. If you want to, you're welcome to, but you can see what's included by us. Maybe we can share the screen and just go over what's included yeah, in it that, real that's quick what I was so you understand. I'm just going to suggest I'll go over each one of these yeah. things. And this training is included in like our starter and professional packages as well. But we, you know, some people were asking, like, do you have a contract? I need a contract. And I was like, we do, but we have never sold it by itself. And yeah. we wouldn't want to sell it without the training that goes with it. I'll tell because... you this. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. Keith. There's two things that I want to explain about what Ryan just said. Not only, <laughs> not only do you not want the purchase and sales agreement without the training, but I would never, ever, 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 ever sell this without the training. There is like, if anything, you're overtrained. Okay. I, we shot a ton of videos and there's so much supporting documentation to set you up for success here. Introduction to the purchase and sales agreement. Like it's literally an intro. Hey, welcome to the course. It's a very long, like <laughs> Keith, Keith says intro. Yeah, what uh, he means is masterclass yeah. because it's like an hour long. Okay. <laughs> I think maybe it's not quite that long, but I don't know. You're right. But though. probably 20, 20 minutes. We have our, the purchase, the actual purchase and sales agreement document. And then Here's some examples. Like it, I, again, I'm not really sure how familiar you, you are with writing up a contract under different exit strategies. And so if you're going to purchase a house cash entrance, do it this way. If you're purchasing a, a house owner finance, or it has an element of owner financing in it, watch that one. If you're going to buy a house subject to, or a hybrid, so this is sub to and owner financing simultaneously, or if it has arrears, Watch this one. We have our purchase and sales agreement cheat sheet. That's this thing where you basically go through and just a you know one or two or three uh, sentences for each paragraph. Here's the cheat sheet itself. Here, yeah, and you... and the cheat sheet just to like explain okay. a little bit, right? It's it literally it's you ex teaching you how to explain the purchase and sale agreement to a seller. Okay. Uh, line by line. So read it. Let, you just Paragraph what three is besides right. the house, what's included in the yeah. sale. All right. Paragraph Keith, you're not four. To show that. Don't show it. All right. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> but then, it's um, very helpful. <laughs> I'm a, we do everything virtually. Every house that we buy is is done virtually. I'm not getting this stuff wet signatured. And so we have our DocuSign uh, template that you can download, upload straight into DocuSign. It has all the form fills and everything pre-made for you how to add a template to DocuSign, working with DocuSign templates. We really try to do a good job making sure that you're set up for success in case you're computer illiterate and don't like working with software and technology. <laughs> um, 
Then we have our memorandum of contract. So this is only the purchase and sales agreement. Then here's all the documentation that you're going to need. Memorandum of contract. Once you have the property under contract, this is how you secure yourself by filing it in public records. If you need to wholesale or assign that contract to another investor, you're going to use that assignment. If you want to JV with another investor or co-wholesale with another investor, you can use one of those two documents. Remember how I told you that we have a lot of sellers that want to back out. And so there's basically three options. We have that scripted out as well. Cancellation of purchase and sales agreement and memorandum. This is basically undoing what you've done in case you're going to back out of the deal. Right of first refusal to purchase real estate. So one of the options for if a seller wants to back out, listen, if I have some old lady who's selling me a house and she says, Keith, I don't want to sell you the house anymore. Why? My husband just passed away and I'm on a fixed income. Okay. Do you have another buyer? Tell me the truth. No, I don't have another buyer. So you're not going to sell the house. No, I'm not going to sell the house. When are you going to sell the house? Keith, I'm going to live here till I die. Okay. I'm not going to, it is wrong to kick that woman out <laughs> in order to make a quick buck. If her husband passed between the time that I entered into a purchase and sales agreement and closing. And so what am I going to do though, to protect myself? Here's a right of first refusal that she's going to sign, notarize and file, making sure that thing is clouded as crap. Nobody is going to buy this house for the next 10 years. Anyway, um, Ryan, are we going to keep these in here? You know, uh, we're not. I'm going to take them out. These but are if not... you buy it today, you'll get these documents too. <laughs> That's great. Hey, these are some extra documents that are really specific to subject to deals and we'll honor it. All right, listen, it's on the screen. If you buy this go, thing before- Go it's buy here, it right now before I couple, take it out. There's a couple thousand dollars of, <laughs> of documentation here. Notes on subject to deals. There is seven critical documents if you're going to buy a house subject to. So if that purchase and sales agreement says, I'm buying your house subject to its underlying mortgage of approximately X amount of dollars, you need some CYA docs. Cover your butt docs, okay? Assignment of escrow proceeds, authorization to change mortgage e, mortgage e clause, authorization to release information, letter of agreement and addendum, limited power of attorney, notice to the mortgage company, and property tax notice. Those are the seven documents. And then here's notes on those sub two docs. How do they need to be filled out? Do they need to be wet signature and notarized or is DocuSign okay? Do you sign personally or do you sign as your company? Those are the things that are in the notes on those sub two docs. We're going to take them out. This is not specific to the purchase and sales agreement, but um, me and Ryan talked about this and he it's, it's he lives in Japan. It's a 12 hour delay. Okay. So I sent him some yeah. messages and so you've he got, see you've got 12 hours <laughs> <laughs> if you want those two. Um, yeah. So I think uh, the, the training along with the documentation that you're getting, I think it's worth um, well over, I think, what did we put this at? 497. Oh my gosh. Like <laughs> anyway. Um, so if you do need a contract or if you need a better contract, um, than what you've got and you liked some of the stuff that you were hearing Keith talk about how uh, this is going to protect you. It's going to make sure that you uh, don't have, basically people can't screw you over if they intend to, because sometimes people yeah. will try to do that. Um, so that's a very important to protect your, your investment because you're investing in marketing, you're investing in, you know, getting the deal put together your due diligence, getting people out there to inspect the property if you're not local and all that costs money. What's your average cost per deal that you put in, Keith? Well, like a few mine, thousand. Is, mine is going to be yeah. oh, you're, ludicrously low compared to everyone else's. It's mine's lower. Be 24 to $2,900 cost per yeah. deal or acquisition. That's very most good. People, yeah, dude, most people is going to be really close to $7,000. Yeah. But any amount, you know, if if that if this saves you from yeah. losing that money, I will tell you uh, this. You know, like you know how I told it's you, it's worth I, it. 
I wasn't lying <laughs> when I said once a month I have an attorney give me a call because a memorandum popped. Every month we do deals and we make good money on those deals. But it, so that's the cake. The icing on the cake is getting a memo that pops. And on average, I'm getting $12,000 every time a memo pops. Sometimes it's 25,000. Sometimes it's literally like only 3,500 or something like that. But it's going to average ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. Right. But you know, it covers that cost that you put in okay. or more. So uh, this, this helps keep you from uh, losing money in your business and hopefully keeps you profitable even when you're going through some hard times. And you will go through hard times oh. it's, <laughs> if you're not already. If you haven't yet, you you will. Uh, it's part of doing business. So appreciate you all. Uh, if anyone has one last question, we will field one more question. We're at the top of the hour, though. So we are going to shut this down if no one has any questions. And uh, we'll try and get that replay um, up so you guys can watch this again and and try to copy down the things that Keith <laughs> shared, despite my protestations. <laughs> um, any questions? Yeah, just kidding. Yeah. Of course. Yes, George. I freaking love you, man. Thanks for being here, bro. <laughs> Ready? Yeah, you're welcome, Emilio. And uh, we do this every Thursday. So it's we're, we try to cover different topics um, and try to help out you guys. You know, and hopefully this was really valuable, even if you – uh, don't buy the hours. If you don't use our contract, that's okay. Use yours, beef it up. You know, you learned a bunch today. You can go back in with your lawyer and, and improve on your contract, or you can just buy ours and it's probably going to be cheaper. Uh, the lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and we train you how to use it. So anyway, go ahead, George. Welcome. Right, I, mine's not actually relative to any of this today. It's kind of a pitch back to the past. So the, the, the CRM program with the whole big shebang, I didn't really see, a link and i and if i click on like the on your website on the professional thing and it says sign up i just go through this like endless loop so should i just reach back out to nick and say hey i'm yep. gonna get started on that is that the best path yep okay sorry about the endless loop there uh yes reach Fine. out to nick i like it. um <laughs> i think in the crm replay at the end there's a qr code oh and a link underneath yeah, it that that's was actually a booking link yeah I, di I didn't want to book another thing with nick if i could just text him and just say hey here i am Right. So yeah, you can just text him and be like, "Hey, I'm ready to, you know, rock and roll or whatever, or I want to go ahead and talk more about it." Yep, you're right. very welcome to do that. Hey, and it's you're telling me it's six a.m. where you are, man. It is eight a.m. here. Eight a.m. Okay, all right. So it's not that bad, but still, it's not that bad. Go you. We start at seven. We have yeah, we have earlier meetings. Me and me and Ryan. So he'll be yeah. waking up at like four in the morning. Hey, did you, did you get your coffee? No, I haven't got my coffee yet. Go get your coffee. That's how you make it work. That's that's good. I like it. Yeah, man. Five minutes. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, George. <clears throat> cool. Anybody else? Uh, if you have a question, we're we're happy. But if you don't, then we're going to shut this down. So, Frank, you've been you've been waiting patiently. I feel like you have a question. Even if you don't, thanks for having your video on. It makes it yeah, so we much appreciate more it. We we like the reactions, and our other friends with video on. Thank you. One of Delano. Thank you, sir. Someone is named Mr. iPhone, iPhone, but yeah. uh, I don't know what Mr. you're. Mr. Under Armour. Hi. <laughs> Welcome, sir. No, I've been. Frank, in a, go ahead. I've been in a contract situation where I have a, a guy that um, we've had him recorded and had pictures of him, you know, doing the transaction. He's just going before the judge trying to back out of it. And it's like, hey, and I think that uh, your purchase agreement with the memorandum and the disclosure that you put on there is excellent. I, I sure the hell wish when he signed the documents to, you know, to sell the house to us, we had all that because he's like, you know, he wasn't drunk. He wasn't on drugs. He just, he was a right mind, but we don't have that uh, nomenclature to, you know, nail it right now. We're in a quiet title with the guy trying to just, we got the property on the contract and we're just trying to close. And this guy is just like, me, me, it's my mortgage. I didn't sell it to them. You know, it's like, come on, man. You know, he's tying up the whole train, but anyway, it's, it's excellent. I really want to work with you guys. We'll figure it out. Are you soon. Frank? Are you the Frank that I just talked to a couple of days yeah, ago? Yeah. Oh, I'm great. All right. Good to put a face to the name. Thanks for coming. Man. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm grinding over here, but you know, we'll see what happens. Yeah. All right. Good deal. <laughs> cool, man. Mr. Mark.
You're up, sir. Do you have a question? You got your hand raised, Mark. It looks like you're walking around your house. <laughs> Okay, we're not sure. Us. He attached it to Maybe his you call. accidentally raised your hand. All right, well, thank you guys so much for coming uh, today, and we hope to see you all next week. Um, can you hear me? Oh, I was oh there muted. we go. Now we can hear yep. you. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was muted trying to speak, and I'll lower my, if I can lower my hand still uh, while I'm speaking. Uh, I can lower it for you. You just talk. Yeah, don't go. worry about it. You're, there we go. you're good. Oh. Getting ready to do it. I was right at the button. Uh, here's what I. <laughs> hey Keith, and uh, I'm sorry, your your partner there. I I didn't get it. Ryan, his name. I'm Ryan, Ryan. Yeah. Hey guys, thanks so. for uh, putting up with me for a second here. I wanted to know. So is Gladly. this? Gonna... <laughs> so this is good for sub two. It's good for residentials. What about commercial? You got any commercial stuff? No, I don't do any any technically. I don't do any commercial. Uh, Okay. I dabble. Well, I, I want something that's going to be a little bit more, you know, I hate to say generalized because I do still do residential, but I want something that's also going to protect me on small commercials, like a little strip shop or a little, uh, you know, corner lot where there's some storefronts and then there's a back residential. There's actually a dual uh, residential commercial property I'm trying to pick up. Yeah, and so I need the biggest thing that our contract, I'm going to just be really frank with you. The biggest difference between a residential contract and a commercial contract, especially in the niche that you're uh -huh. talking in, because if you think about residential, we're not just talking about strip malls. Sometimes it's parking garages. Sometimes it's storage units. Sometimes it's, it, it can be freaking anything, <laughs> seriously. Um, yeah. And so what you're talking about your, the biggest thing that our contract is missing is talking about leases. That's going to be almost, uh, you, you're going to want to have a clause specifically in your due diligence period that allows you to look at their numbers, show me your pro forma. Let me make sure that these numbers are actually going to work. And if not, I'm out during my due diligence period. Yes. Yeah, and I so want technically ours allows you to do that because ours is so general. Um, you could back out for any reason. You could think that there's four steps going up to the front porch and, and there's only three and that pisses you off. And you, no, I'm sorry. The numbers don't work. There was supposed to be four and now there's only three. You could pull out for the stupidest reason. I love because it because it says for any reason or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me just. That's, that's what I like. I want. I wanted to You're be not general. allowed to show I it. I won't show you it. May explain. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I meant when I said. If, I want are you something ready? General, more generalized that works. Yeah. Well, this is this may be a little bit too general. Honestly, it's going to be so general. Here's the thing. Again, I dabble in commercial. We've done three commercials. Um, I don't know what I'm talking about. I am not an expert. Take everything that I'm about to say with a grain of salt. When you're and dealing your with lawyer check it. <laughs> but when you're dealing with commercial people, hopefully on a, on a generic, um, like a conceptual basis, you're going to, everybody is going to agree with me. If you don't, you're stupid. When you're dealing with people who own commercial buildings, they are highly educated, savvy people compared to people that you're going to be dealing with in the residential space, uh, specifically when we're dealing with our big five, divorce, inheritance, pre foreclosure, health and safety, and tired landlord. Right. Right. And so they're going to read this purchase and sales agreement and be like, bro, there is no way in hell I am signing that agreement. You have too many unfair advantages because this is what it says. Amongst many other things in the inspection, you see there's probably 12 sentences here, <laughs> but if buyer is not satisfied with the physical condition of the real property and so notifies seller in writing prior to the closing date, then buyer may, at buyer's option, terminate this agreement. Love it. Love it. There you go. That's it what works I, very well. I've, I've written that before myself, you know, and professionally type, you know, so it looked right typed it up but you know i've had people come back on 
on me. They I get these high powered lawyers and they bring up this other they bring up these other I don't know, I can't even I'm trying to think of a an example. They bring up another subject. It goes around the back door and they stopped me in my tracks. And I lost uh, you know, some uh EMD over it a couple of times. So I wasn't happy with that. And I went in as general as what basically kind of what you're speaking about. I don't know. I, I, I don't want to have that happen a third time. <clears throat> well, um, there used to be a lot of stuff that I would hand write. In paragraph 25, we have additional terms and conditions in our purchase and sales agreement. And I used to hand write. And I did it a hundred times. Let's see if I can remember it verbatim. The sale of this property is contingent upon the seller's satisfactory verification of all numbers. Of what? What was that last part? Of all numbers. This sale all numbers. is contingent upon the seller's satisfactory verification of all numbers. So again, yeah. if there's, yeah. I thought there's four steps. There's actually only three steps. That's a number I don't like about. Right, right. I'm not saying okay. that you should do that. I'm just truth is found in extremes, and that's why I'm bringing up no, I, this I, example. No, I like the direction you're, you know, the angle you're coming from. Right, that's what I used to try to do, and then the pandemic happened, and that's a whole other story. So I've yeah, been living. The point that I'm, the point that I'm trying to make is, I used to write it, like handwrite it. Yeah, yeah that's how I. Oh, that's why I don't said, do that. That's stupid. That's like shining a light that you may as well take out a damn highlighter and say, pay attention to this thing. You're not going to like it. No, put it in black and white ink, put it in ink. And then it just gets glazed over with everything else. It holds the same value. I shouldn't say it gets glazed over. That seems potentially deceptive. That's not my intent. Everything holds the same value when it's all the same font, the same boldness, the same color. I, right. And I only I, wrote it those couple of times and I learned. So you're right. <laughs> And and then I went back to typing it, which just made more sense. And it, you're right, it's more secure. Uh, yeah. They can't come back at you enough on too many things and find those back doors. So no, yeah. you're I get you. And I, that's why I said I like the angle uh, you're coming from. So yeah, I'm gonna go back to doing. And I, and I've been out it for half a dozen years or almost well five years since 2019 so i'm just jumping back in to the market here now uh talk sounds like people. you need to get yourself a fresh new purchase and sales agreement oh that and, 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 and i've been trying to work out the transactional and reserve costs you know which i that's really important going in at the price points that i'm trying to jump okay. into so once i get all oh. that in 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 squared uh in the squared circle or <laughs> or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. you're right. And the contract has to make sense. And it, and it, and it, and it's been shaky in the past, but I, you know, going back in, I want to make sure I'm yeah. not going to trip over my own heels, you right. know, right. But I appreciate it. All right. Very good. Yes, sir. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate you. Yeah. Thanks, All right. Sure. Thank you, Mark. All right, everyone. We are Thanks shutting it down. It's been too long. Thank <laughs> you all always. very much for your time and Thank attention. You. Appreciate seeing yeah. you guys. Have a wonderful evening. If you have evening. other questions, feel free to put them in uh, the Facebook group or you can email us uh, as well. You, you probably, unless you've unsubscribed or marked me as spam, then. <laughs> All right. All right. Have a great Take weekend. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye.